Bethel Church and welcome to week five of our online worship experience together. We pray that, that over the course of these past five weeks through these online worship experiences that you have been encouraged, that you've been uplifted, but most importantly that you have been strengthened in your faith. And we want to just say thank you again. I know we've said this before, but thank you guys so much for engaging with us so well in this season of kind of uncertainty and online worship. Thank you for engaging us through your your calls, your phone calls, encouraging phone calls, emails, texts, through the giving that you've been doing. And we just want to encourage you, continue to do those things as we move forward through this season. And speaking of this season, this is a really tough season. It's tough on us and it's tough on you guys. And we, we miss you. And we yearn for the day that we can, we can fill this sanctuary and we can come back together and worship our great God together once again under one roof. Uh, we pray for that day and we yearn for it. But in the meantime, when we're in this season, and I know it's tough, like I said, for all of us, but I want to remind you of something. I want you to know something, and I believe this is really, really important, and that is this. God is on the move right now. God is on the move in a really, really powerful way. And what do I mean by that? Let me, let me show you what I mean by that. Just within the past two weeks, Bethel, we've heard from someone in small town Delaware who's been watching us each week. On Easter Sunday, somebody from Greenville, the Greenville region of South Carolina reached out to us and they just wanted us to know that they've been watching. There's a cluster of folks, uh, some members and others aren't members, that have been engaging us from Florida, from Sarasota to Naples. We received a call earlier this week from a couple down in Gulf Shores, Alabama. That's right, Gulf Shores, Alabama. And all they wanted to say was, hey, we're watching from down here. And that's just the beginning of it, Bethel Church. We've had phone calls, we've had emails, we've had texts from Houston, Texas, from Dallas, Texas, from Phoenix, Arizona, from L.A., California. Our friend Moses reached out to us. Seattle, Washington, someone from Nevada sent an encouraging note. Colorado, we've heard a lot of feedback from our friends out in Iowa who've been watching, some of whom have never engaged with the church before, and now they're engaging us. From Illinois to Indiana to Michigan, all of Chicagoland, from Oswego to Crown Point, from Lombard to Gary. And the list, it could go on and on. Friends, if this is the case with us, with Bethel Church, rest assured that it is happening all over the world as well. In fact, earlier this week, I came across this magnificent report. This report from a major online church platform. And the report said this, that through online services, get this, through online services, just on Easter weekend alone, over 70,000 people, I'll say that again, over 70,000 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Church, when I say that God is on the move in a powerful way, I'm not kidding. He is. He's pricking at hearts. He's, he's opening doors. He's causing his church to rise up. And even what the enemy means for evil. Church, Jesus Christ is causing something magnificent to happen through that. Thanks be to God for what he's doing right now. Now as we continue in our worship this morning, I want you to listen to these words. I want you to really hear these words from the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy as he proclaims the gospel to us this morning. Paul says this, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but now has been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Friends, the gospel is all-powerful. 
the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ came down. He took upon himself all of our sins, all of our shortcomings, and he died. Good Friday. And then three days later on Easter, he rose again. And right now, he is forever seated at his Father's right hand, interceding for you and me. That's the gospel. If you believe that, and it can save, it, it will save Anyone, everyone who believes, as Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that. And I pray that you're not ashamed of that either. Why? Because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And this morning I want to sing about that salvation. Sing about that good news together. Last week we taught you a song. And this week we're going to ask you to engage. To sing along with us. Death was arrested. And proclaim the gospel with us through song. The gospel that is spreading like wildfire across our world. Across our, our nation right now. Let's join together in worship. Singing when death was arrested. Sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested in my life Redeemed, only beauty remains. And my open heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my debt And he called me his
started. Our lives began. Praise you, Jesus. We praise you for being obedient and going to the cross, taking on all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our brokenness, so that our lives could begin anew with you, in a relationship with you, Jesus, with the Father and the Holy Spirit. We are so grateful. And, to morning, and this morning, we give our praises to you. Again, we just want to live in that resurrection. We want to believe that Jesus is alive and we are going to live in a place where we are not afraid because our King has overcome the grave. He has overcome death and we are alive. We thank you so much. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we get the opportunity to confess our faith, and we're going to do it together. So if you're able and you're willing, let's stand where you are in your living room or wherever you're gathered, and let's recite and confess together what we believe about Jesus and the resurrection and the life to come. Let's confess these things together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing.
Will you join me in prayer this morning? Jesus, you truly are our only hope, our only comfort in both life and in death, the light of our, our lives, the light of the world, our strength, our song, the, the cornerstone, the, the tested, the precious cornerstone of our foundation, the solid ground on which we stand through the fiercest droughts of this life and through the fiercest storms of this life. Jesus, it's you. You're our everything. And we, and we confess that apart from you, apart from you, Jesus, there's nothing. And yet, Jesus, with you, through faith in you, and what you've done for us on our behalf by going to the cross on Good Friday and then three days later on Easter being risen from the dead, Jesus, through that, through faith in that, because of that, we, we have everything. We have life to the absolute fullest, the most abundant life that we could ever ask for or ever imagine. Jesus, we have it. Jesus, because of you, we don't, we don't have to live in fear. Your word, it declares it. Fear not. Don't be afraid. For I've told you from old, from, from way back. And declared it. You're my witnesses. God, we, we are your witnesses. Is there a God besides me, you say? No, there isn't. There's no other rock. Jesus, we, we declare that it's, that it's upon you that we stand. That it's upon you that we live and we breathe and we have our being. And, and through you, through faith in you, Jesus, we have power. The same power that rose you from the dead is now alive in us. It's coursing through our veins. Jesus, may we, may we take hold of who we are in you and live each and every day, every single day, in that light. Jesus, I pray that all who see us, all who talk to us, all who cross our paths, I pray that they might see you. May they see Christ in us and through us. Christ be glorified in and through our lives. God, as we think about the state of our culture, of our world right now, our hearts, they break. And we lament the reality that so many people are facing right now as a result of this virus, this, this pandemic that's sweeping across our world. Father, we lift up to you those whose jobs are being affected, even taken away or cut back, God. For those who have been directly affected or infected with this virus, for those who have lost loved ones, people that they love, people that they care deeply about, whether it's from this or, or anything else right now, God. Father, to all of these and more, please let them know that you're right there with them. No, no matter what the circumstance is that surrounds them, just as you promised in your word, when you said to us, you said, I will never leave you. I will never ever forsake you. God, you won't. You haven't and you won't. You're faithful, God. May we take hold of those promises now and feel your arms of, of love and care and compassion wrapped around us now tighter than we've ever felt them before. And God, we also praise you. We praise you for what you're doing uh, through this season of life right now. We see evidence of you all around us, even God in the midst of the storm. We see evidence of you that you're at work. And we thank you and we praise you for that. God, I pray that you would continue to draw families closer together at this time and in that and, and through that that you would continue to draw people God continue to draw people closer and closer to yourself to your son to Jesus and it's in his name that we pray amen
Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm in the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn in the suffering in the sorrow when my sinking hopes are Church. I'd like to take you to one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's kind of hard to say that because, to be honest, I have a lot of favorite passages of Scripture, but one of my favorites is from Psalm 46, where we hear these words, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore will not fear though the earth give way, though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam when the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help at the break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolation he has brought upon the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spears. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I'm exalted among the nations. I'm exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. 
The psalm starts with a strong statement. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we'll not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. I don't know about you, but I suspect many of us do feel like our world is being shaken. It's giving way and mountains are falling into the heart of the sea. Just think about what you hear and see in the news over the last couple of weeks and days. We get daily updates on the coronavirus. We hear about the global scope of the pandemic. The stock market has dropped over 20 points. People are looking at their retirements and their annuities and wondering, what's next? In fact, I know someone who recently just looked at me and said, I guess I'm working till about 75 or 100. Sadly, that's the way many of us sometimes feel. And then there's all the, the job situations, the job layoffs, and the cut back on hours. In fact, we're facing right now an all-time high number of people who are facing unemployment in our world. Then there's the loneliness, the social isolation, especially for the extroverts out there. It's a hard time, almost a depressing time for some people. And as a pastor, I've heard the heart ache more than once of people who have come to me as a pastor, my mom or my dad, my, my husband, my wife, someone they love dearly is in the hospital or in a nursing home and they can't see them, they can't reach out to them, they can't embrace them and hug them and tell them they love them and care for them. The heartbreak of the social isolation. And then there's all the uncertainty. Graduates wondering about how and where will they find a job and apply for a job when they can't even go out of the doors and they have to stay at home. Uncertainty about internships. Couples wondering about their weddings that are coming up in the next couple of months. People worried about, what about the birth of the baby? Will my baby be safe to be born in this context? In a hospital where there are so many people who are sick. And husbands who want to be there for the birth of their child. Yes, there's a lot of uncertainty and pain. I think of the grief. The grief of people that have to delay memorial services. And I've been invited three times in the last month to an online funeral service where I can't embrace them into love and concern and show my heart and be with them in that time of pain and grief. Yeah, we can relate to the psalmist and say, yeah, it feels like our world is being shaken to its very cores. And that imagery, the mountains being thrown to the heart of the sea, I think in word pictures, and to me that's a powerful word picture, the mountain. One of the most secure, immovable forces in our world today, and yet that immovable force is being thrown into the heart of the sea. That's the sense there. It doesn't say fall, but it's being cast, it's being hurled down into the heart of the sea. And in the Old Testament, the sea was a sign of chaos. It was a sign of death. And so now the most immovable forces in our world today as humans are thrown into utter chaos, even death. So where do we go? What do we do? What's the answer? We've already heard that a lot of the things that we hope and pray about are not answers anymore. We can't rely on health and strength and jobs and, and our finances and bank accounts. So where do we turn? What do we do in answer to all this? God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. What does that look like when our world is being turned upside down? I want to introduce you to someone, a man, a man who faced complete financial collapse as literally his wealth was stolen away from him, a man who stood with a broken heart at the loss of his children because of deaths due to a storm that swept through their home, a man whose health failed him to the point that he felt like he was on the brink of death itself. A man who, who looked to his friends for comfort and strength, and yet the friends turned on him and became almost accusatory of him, blaming him, even though he was walking in an upright, faithful way before God. Even his wife. His wife turned to him and said, just curse God and die. Give it up. What's the point? I want you to hear this man from his own words. Look at this quote with me. 
He says, my relatives stay far away and my friends have turned against me. My family is gone and my close friends have forgotten me. My breath is repulsive to my wife. I'm rejected by my own family. Even young children despise me. When I stand to speak, they turn their backs on me. My close friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. I have been reduced to skin and bones and have escaped death by the skin of my teeth. Those are powerful words of pain and agony, especially when you take them back into the context in which they were spoken. This man is living in a culture in which age was revered. Children showed honor and respect where the reputation of a community was at stake in the care and support that they gave one another. And family, oh, family was important. They lived in family clans. And yet, look at it. The kids, they detest, despise. Friends turn their backs and forget about him. And his wife, she is in essence is saying here, are you still breathing? Give up and die. That's how deep his pain was. So the question comes back, where do we turn? What was his answer? How did he respond? After these words of pain, he continued to speak. And he said this to us. He said, I know, in the face of all this, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Pushed to the brink of death itself, he makes a profound statement of truth. In fact, he makes in this passage five statements of truth for us to look at today. He starts by saying, I know. In, in saying those words, it is a statement of faith even when you can't see it with your own eyes. It's not a matter of sight, it's a matter of faith. It, it's a matter of fact for him and not just wishful thinking. This is something that is not just head knowledge, but it is the heart knowledge. It is something that grips the very core of his being when he says, I know something. I know this very truth. And the beautiful thing is this language here when he says, I know. It's an intimate word. It's a personal word. To know in the Old Testament is a sense of intimate, personal relationship. Now, if you've been tracking along with us over the course of this year so far, you know that one of the key words we've been focusing on is joy. And we found that, that the answer to joy and the key to joy in hard times is in relationship. And here he's saying, I have a personal relationship. And so he's able to find joy and strength in relationship. In relationship with who or what? He said, I know my Redeemer. Now, when we hear the word Redeemer, we generally think about sin and guilt. And truth be told, that is the bottom line. That, that our sin and our guilt is being addressed through the mercy and grace of God and the saving work of Jesus Christ. That's foundational. But the word here is referring to much more than just a sense of, are your sins forgiven? The word here is for the kinsman Redeemer. A kinsman redeemer is that close relative who comes to be your champion when you can't do it yourself. He's the one who comes to you to right the wrongs in your life, to heal the pains of your life, to bring a healing to the brokenness of your life. He is the one who's the guarantor of your restoration and your place in the people of God and the land of God. And he's saying, I know my kinsman redeemer. And then he says something very interesting. He says, and I know that my kinsman redeemer, 
he will stand. Now, in saying those words, he's not just referring to some type of pose. He shall stand. No, by saying he shall stand, he's conveying a truth to us once again. You see, he's saying that he will stand and he's not running or fleeing. No, you can stand in the face of adversaries when you have strength and power, when you're victorious over your adversaries. When he says he shall stand, he's not saying he's laboring anymore. No, you stand when the work is done, when it's an accomplished reality. And he shall stand instead of, and he is bowing in submission, is acknowledging his power, his control, his sovereignty over all. And Job here is saying, I know my Redeemer. And my Redeemer has accomplished his work. My Redeemer stands in power and in victory in the face of enemies. He is victorious and he is over all and sovereign over all. So to go back to what we were saying earlier, when our world is shaken to its very core, when we feel like all the resources around us have abandoned us and failed us, there is a Redeemer whose work is perfect and complete. And Job could stand in that victory and in that power. That's the challenge he brings to us. I know that my Redeemer, yes, he stands. And I will see him with mine own eyes, even after my own flesh has been destroyed. That's a profound statement. He's looking beyond the here and now. He's looking beyond death itself. He's saying death does not have the final word. Because of my Redeemer's accomplished work, I am a child of life even as I face death. He's looking forward to the resurrection. Here's an Old Testament person looking forward in faith and speaking prophetically about what the Redeemer will do and that he will share in that resurrection power and life. Think about that. Our Redeemer stood victorious. And in his victory, you and I too will see our Redeemer with our own eyes, with our glorious new resurrection bodies in his power, in his glory, and in his kingdom. It's no wonder, he says, and my heart yearns for this. That's a statement of hope in the face of pain. That's a statement of confidence instead of fear. That's a statement of faith in his almighty God, who is his fortress, who is his rock, who is his kinsman redeemer. That brings us back to that verse we started with. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble, even when the world is shaken to its core, even when the most stable things in our world fall into chaos itself. The Old Testament speaks in a general way, God. Job points us a little bit even further into it by speaking prophetically of this kins and redeemer. But we who stand with the privilege of the New Testament know who that kinsman redeemer is. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. See, God and Jesus Christ didn't love us at a distance. He didn't stay removed and say, good luck there, you folks. I hope you can make it. But no, he took on our flesh and blood. He literally walked in our own shoes. And he experienced everything that we have experienced. He knew what it was like to be betrayed and rejected. He knew what it was like to be lied about and slandered. He knew what it was like to be hungry and, and cold and, and lonely and homeless. He knew what it was like to live at the by the charity of others around him. He knew pain, physical pain, mental pain. He knew what it was like to face temptation. He didn't sin, but he faced temptation. In fact, he withstood the attack, the very direct attack of Satan himself. And he stood at the grave of a loved one and grieved, and shed tears. And he faced his own imminent death, knowing it was coming. 
and knowing the torture and anguish that it would bring. And he died. He experienced all the things that you and I have experienced. And he comes to us. In his power, in his glory, he comes to us as that great and glorious redeemer. That raises a question. Do you know this kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ? Not just head knowledge. It's often been said, you can miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance between your head and your heart. It's not just knowing facts. No, in fact, the Bible warns us the devil knows facts about God and he shudders because he realizes where he's at. No, it's not enough to know here but to know here. Does that guarantee we'll not have trouble and problems? No, the psalmist spoke in very direct terms that, that God was his refuge and strength even as the world is being turned upside down. Job said, I know my Redeemer lives even as he was being pushed to the very brink of death. It doesn't promise us a life without difficulties. In fact, Jesus himself acknowledged that. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have hardships. But, and he adds these words of assurance, but take heart, don't be afraid, don't fear, because I have overcome the world. He is victorious in these things. And the beautiful thing is when we know him, know him intimately and personally, we can find joy instead of fear. Why? Because he is with us. Jesus has promised that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He promises that when we face hard times, when we have to go through the floods, when we have to face the fire, he is there with us, carrying us through these things. One of my favorite verses comes out of Psalm 23. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when I face those deepest, darkest times, I fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. God is our guide in those moments. He is our protector. He is our provider. He's our comforter in those times. I love that passage. You see, it tells me that God is with me in those times. Jesus Christ went to death before me. He walked through death and he came out the other side victorious. And then he says, I will come to you in those dark moments of your life. When you go through the deepest, darkest valleys, I will be with you in those times. See, Jesus doesn't stand in heaven and say, come on, I'm over here. Suck it up. Be strong. You can make it. I'm cheering for you. That's right. Do it. No, he says, no. In those moments when you have to walk the darkness, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to lead you to it. I'm going to lead you through it. And I'm going to bring you out of it into my light and into my life and into the glories of my presence for all of eternity. That's what he's promising to us. And so I come back to you and ask you again, do you know this kinsman redeemer, Jesus? It's the most important question you will ever face in your life. It's one you must answer. And I pray that you will say, yes, I know my kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, in my heart as he grips my life. But how about us who know Jesus Christ? Sometimes our world is shaken too. The challenge to us there is to live in the reality and the care and the blessing, even in hard times, of that kinsman redeemer. I think of the disciples in that very first Easter. It started on Good Friday. They saw Christ being arrested, drug off, tried. And with the crucifixion, they fled. They hid. Why? Because they were afraid. Fear gripped their being. And they locked themselves. John 20 tells us they locked themselves inside a room to try to hide and protect themselves because of their fear. And they weren't just locked in a physical room. To be honest, their hearts were locked up by fear itself. And then, and then Jesus comes and appears to them. And Jesus himself says to them, peace be with you. Jesus Christ speaks to them. 
In, in fact, Jesus Christ blesses them and says, receive my shalom blessing, my wholeness, my wholesomeness, my restoration, my healing, my shalom, my peace be with you. Christ speaks those words even today in the storms of our life. But I want you to think about it a step further. You see, I don't believe it was the words that made the difference. What made the difference? They encountered the living, risen, victorious Christ. The one who went to the cross to pay for their sins. The one who arose victorious. Just like Job said, I know my Redeemer will stand again. They saw Jesus Christ standing again, triumphant over sin, triumphant over Satan, triumphant over death itself. They saw the risen Christ in all of his power, in all of his glory. The risen Christ who, who in just a short time there later would ascend into heaven and declare before heaven itself, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. And he comes and speaks that to them. They encountered the living Christ. And they were changed from fear to joy. And when I hear that, I, I want to echo Job and say, my heart burns. It, it burns with hope. It yearns for that day. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day in which my Redeemer my kinsman redeemer will set right all that was set wrong by sin, bringing his healing, bringing his wholeness, bringing a restoration. I'm looking forward to a day in which my world is no longer touched because of cancer or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, where he's making all things new again, including me, giving me a glorious resurrection body, transforming me from being a rebellious sinner to being a beloved adopted child of God by giving me access before the throne of God and the glories of heaven. That's his promises to us. That's his reality. And so we can look to him and hear his words, receive his blessing, but more than anything else, we can live in the reality of Jesus Christ, our kinsman, redeemer. That's what we celebrate in Good Friday. That's what we celebrate in Easter. And that's what we can carry on from here. When we live in the reality of Jesus Christ, we can live Easter every day. Why? Because Christ is the answer to all of our fears. Christ is the answer to ultimate victory in him. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today we thank you for walking in our shoes, for experiencing everything that we have experienced. Because Lord, we now know that we can come to you no matter where we're at or what we're facing with confidence. In fact, that's what you promise us in Hebrews. You promise in Hebrews that you are our great high priest, that you sympathize with us and because you understand and sympathize with us, you invite us to come boldly to your throne of grace for help for mercy, for grace in our times of need. And so, Lord, even today, we pour out our hearts to you. But, Lord, as we pour out our hearts to you, keep our eyes fixed not on the problems around us, but upon you, the author and perfecter of our faith, our kinsman, redeemer, and our savior, the one who has made us your beloved children through faith in you. Lord, if there's anyone here today who, who does not know you, don't give them any peace till they find their peace in you. And for your children, Lord, deepen our sense of peace and trust. May we echo Job saying, we know our kinsman redeemer. We know he lives and he reigns. His work is perfect and complete. And through faith in him, we share in that. Lord, thank you for being the answer to our fears and the source of our eternal glory and life. We pray this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. So Pastor Cal has just reminded us that Christ is the answer to all of our fears. And we're going to sing a song that, that talks about that. We're going to learn it together. So I, I just ask that you listen to this passage from Isaiah that this song comes from and just soak in that reality that Christ is the answer to all of our fears that we'll ever face throughout our entire life. So here, Isaiah 43, 1 through 2. But now this is what the Lord says. 
He who created you, Jacob. He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Let's sing about these truths, not afraid. the power of your word enough to seek your kingdom first beyond the barren place beyond the ocean waves when I walk through the waters I won't be overcome when I go through the rivers I will not be drowned my God Promises you make. There isn't one that is delayed, not one. So I will not lose heart. Here I will lift my arms and start to sing to the night. My praise will call the sun to rise. Declare the battle won. Declare. song reminding us that that we can have peace because of the victory in Jesus Christ that we can face this world without fear and to live in the joy of the Lord what a beautiful challenge what a beautiful promise what a beautiful song I don't know about you but I'm looking forward to next week 
to find out what God has in store for us as we continue this journey together and as we enter into a new series together. I invite you to join us next week. But now as we prepare to go, I want us to hear that blessing of peace one more time. The blessing of peace that Jesus spoke to the disciples in that very first Easter. And Jesus speaks to your heart today as well. Go in the blessing of our kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift the light of his face upon you and grant you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.